And for our last speaker in this session, I'd like to invite my friend uh, Pedro Papas. Thank you, and thanks for the opportunity, and thanks again for all the participation. It's been a wonderful conference up to this point. The, um, the focus of this session was really to kind of get us to this point, which is um, what do we do in the future? Where, what are the opportunities? What kind of studies can we do? Um, as many of you were not, many of you were not around when we were uh, the older group, but this in the past was the only thing we did at our, at our prior studies. We, we did, we spent a day and a half discussing what are the possible studies we can do. Um, and so we've turned this much more into an educational meeting and, and I really like this format. Um, the only thing that I don't like um, up to this point, what I've heard this session is how I was exposed from my computer illiteracy. Um, but thank you, Jerry, for bring, highlighting that. <laughs> All right. All right, let's see here. Okay, so let's make a few observations. Um, first of all, uh, you know, from the outset, this group goes back to 1979, and it was purely a clinical trials collaborative group. That's all. Um, we did um, trials in conjunction with industry, infrastructure funded by government, and that was the contract. That was the nature of the contract. And there are a few of us left here who, were, who you know, remember some of those earlier days. I was not around at that time, but, but uh, there are a couple of folks here who kind of joined not long after that. Times have changed. Um, they've changed, and that's an understatement. But we've responded to those changes, and, and let me just kind of describe how we have. So in 2006, when the contract ended, um, it was a double-edged sword. We, we no longer had infrastructure funding, but we also had the freedom to do the trials that we wanted to do um, and to embrace other activities, which we really hadn't been able to do. So some examples of that were creating registries, doing um, retrospective surveys, diagnostic studies, database mining, and epidemiologic studies. All those things we started doing really only in 2006. Um, and then, um, you know, we also then started to, rather than running a study uh, start to finish, we embraced this concept of, you know, uh, study design from the beginning serving as the data review committee or the DRC, doing the analysis and the, and the manuscript, but then letting somebody else run the study day to day. Um, and those are not bad developments at all. In 2014, um, we really felt like we had to become uh, a, a nonprofit organization because now we also had the, the potential um, to do educational activities as well. And it was really the only way to handle this and do this in a transparent way and not, you know, not uh, get into institutional trouble or trouble, you know, with um, um, uh, the IRS. And so it, it has worked well for us to do these things. It's given us a little more flexibility. So the MSG RC is a, you know, it's our nonprofit. It's the governing body of the MSG, which still conducts all of these activities. So just not to confuse you. And so as a consequence, we have very many fewer studies that we do um, from start to finish, I would say, you know, where we directly, where we design, we run, um, do pretty much all aspects of the study. And I can think of three that we have done that in the last, you know, 10 years plus. And that was our first study since the new iteration of our group, and then MSG 10, with, which we did with Synexis, and then 15, which we just wrapped up, which is an endemic mycosis trial. And so, you know, I think that we, we really do have to think in um, a different way as we go forward. We have many, many more opportunities, um, and we have to think beyond, well, we're a clinical trials group that only does you know, RCTs. Uh, that clearly is not what defines us anymore. It's part of what we do, but it's not the whole thing. And so I, I mean this, these next few slides, and that's all I have, is just to, open, to get you thinking about, you know, where we should go. Uh, this is not by any way, in any way, an exhaustive list. It's just things that, um, you know, I, that come to mind that we 
should explore. I think most of these are, are factual, some are aspirational, but I think there are things that we should uh, sort of c contemplate and really expand from this. And so I've broken them down into five categories, and I'm going to talk about each one a little bit, and then hopefully when we come together and all the speakers are up here, because we're all, these, all these talks are integrated, they're all about what, how are we going to move forward and do clinical trials? Um, hopefully then we can start thinking in those terms. So clinical trials, let's start with that. Um, sort of our strong suit. I think it should be obvious to everyone that invasive candidiasis, industry doesn't really need us to run a clinical invasive candidiasis trial. Um, I think they do need us to help design the trial so that they're fair, that they're transparent, that they actually make sense, and they build on um, what's been done in the past. Um, and also uh, to help them think about how we might look at things in the future. Somebody mentioned today 14 versus 10 days as length of therapy. And I know industry is going to fund that, but it can be done within our group for sure. Um, but I think that if we were to look at the one area in candidiasis that's not... Um, you know, really maybe amenable to just a, a company doing a large phase three trial is one that really focuses on um, Canada Oris and folding into that the antifungal resistant Canada species. Now we've designed a trial like this. It is at NIH now being, being reviewed, I think as we speak. We call it an MSG-18. It uses ATI 2307, which you heard about earlier, as the, the study drug. It's a dose ranging type of study. It only targets 96 patients, so it's just a small phase two type of study. But whether this is funded or not um, is almost irrelevant. What we've done is create a template for how we can do phase two trials that look at where one could plug in literally a number of other compounds that could be candidate compounds for the same. The, the, the key here is, this is the niche. How else are you going to study Canada Oris, you know, in a prospective, comparative sort of way? And I know Synexus is doing, doing some work in that area as well. But we would really like to do this um, in a really carefully thought out, uh, comparative, uh, hopefully blinded sort of way, uh, not as a salvage. Um, and I think in doing this, we might accomplish what some of our friends uh, who you heard about, uh, who you heard from earlier today, um, specifically Tom Harrison, um, David Bulwer, and others who, you know, have really just done remarkable work in Africa. Um, and we didn't mention uh, investigators in Southeast Asia, but just done remarkable work in those areas and, and you know, built a system whereby um, you can take new compounds and, and essentially plug them in to a population that's now become quite, you know, comfortable with becoming involved in clinical trials, and they've done enormously useful work. So those are my thoughts on Canada. Now, there are a lot of other things that we can do, but, you know, that we could speak about specifics and hopefully get into that um, later. With invasive astrogelysis, once again, we're not going to do... Uh, a 500 patient trial. They've been done. Uh, and so it, it's, it's, it's kind of um, silly for us to be thinking that that can't be done without us. It, it clearly is. But again, helping in the initiation, the design um, is probably where we could help the best. What, what is needful though is thinking of ways that we might look at antifungal resistant organisms. Um, or individuals who fail therapy. Now, it, look, it looks like um, F2G is, has kind of started in that direction. Um, not truly, um, well, uh, not sure how, how blinded comparative, I can't remember all the details of the study, but the focus is hitting areas that are not already covered in large phase three trials. So we're looking at you know, phase two, possibly phase three types of trouble, tri uh, trials, and then, of course, there's always the issue of primary prophylaxis. But even then, primary prophylaxis studies, and it have to, by na by, because the breakthrough events are relatively rare, large numbers of, of patients, 
And until we get to a point where we're doing electronic monitoring um, rather than in-person monitoring, that um, that's really going to be handled by a company in a, with a, a, a well-paid CRO. A couple of comments about mucormycosis. We, we, I know there are many in the audience have had these discussions before. We've not really thought mucormycosis is all that amenable to clinical trial. Part of it was because of the relative rarity of it. Well, that's no longer true. When 10% of the population is diabetic um, and all the biologics that are being thrown about, thrown about that we've heard about, the large number of OTRs that we have, not to mention the stem cell transplants, the patients are now out there. If our, if our institution is any reflection of that, they're there. Um, so there's, it's no longer a, rare, a patient rarity situation. Now it's just a matter of how, how could you properly design this and factor in those things that are difficult to factor in, i.e. surgery, which is required for almost everyone who is going to survive. And there are several people here who've thought a lot about mucor, um, and so I'm interested to understand what you kind of think about this. We've talked in the past at this meeting about centers of excellence, COE, which is mean that basically have these patients come to 10, 12, 15 centers across the country where they can be managed more or less in a consistent manner. But I think this is worth discussing. For crypto, it should be obvious that there's not a lot we can offer to the HIV infected population. That's been done so well in Southeast Asia and in Africa, and it would be presumptuous for us to, to think that we have a great deal to offer uh, to that population. However, as has been brought up, and I've brought it up many times, and I've talked to John about it on a number of occasions, um, we, we haven't had a, a non-HIV-related crypto study since the late 80s. Um, and, and so, you know, if you believe that these patients are different, that they need to be managed different, that they have somewhat different outcomes, and I think we have plenty of data to suggest that, uh, see a poster that we have here. Um, you know, these, th looking at those populations of both compromised and non immunocompromised compromised patients, very important. And that will be done here. That is here in the more developed world um, where, we, where the resources are around to do that. These outcomes, their out outcomes are different. Um, and I would disagree with what one of my colleagues said earlier today, that no one should die with crypto who is HIV negative. You know, these patients die in, before you know they have crypto oftentimes. They're overwhelmingly sick. Uh, I agree that individuals who survive several days uh, should not, but, but oftentimes they come in and they're so desperately ill. Um, and so I think that, that we need to look at this and think about this carefully and understand what we can offer to these patients. For the endemics, it was said earlier today that we really haven't done anything um, in the endemics. Uh, well, MSG15 shows, and that was a study that we just finished with Maine as a sponsor. Um, it was an all-comers endemic, um, mainly histo, blasto, coxie, and sporo. But we enrolled 88 patients in about 18 months, 24 months. Um, the um, um, mainly a PK and safety type of study, but they can be done. It proves that the patients are out there. Uh, what's really lacking right now is the desire to, to you know, look at this population with a new compound. Now, the exception is COXI, and I think that um, based on conversations we have with Neil Ampel and some of the others in the, in the COXI group, it's time that we kind of rejoin or our, our, you know, reconnect at the interest level and start understanding how we can uh, facilitate that group, the COXI group, in getting studies off the ground. What role we could play, whether it's in study design or serving as the DRC, or advocating for them. But there's certainly something we can do, and there's a lot of interest in COXI for a lot of different reasons that I won't go into, but there are clinical trials to be done in COXI, where there's still a lot of progress to be made in terms of outcomes. Um, Maybe not so much in, in histo and blasto, where outcomes are really pretty good. For the rare moles, um, I think we all understand that these are not amenable to randomized clinical trials. They're just too few. 
Um, and so patient registries are, are going to be the way to go, uh, salvage studies, et cetera. Um, but very detailed outcomes are, are required in these types of studies. You can't just haphazardly correct, connect, collect the data. I'd like to also mention that, and this is something that's absolutely new to us, we're not dermatologists, and yet one of the big emerging problems uh, in the world right now is multidrug resistant azole and terbinafine resistant dermatophytes, dermato T. rubrum, um, et cetera. Um, I see these all the time. They're referred to me from the dermatologist. This is a problem. It's a huge problem possibly generated by over-the-counter agents, but it's a big problem. We have to decide as a group whether we want to tackle this. Um, it's a, it, it would be new for us. I'm so glad Jerry started this off because we do need to explore new approaches to trial design and we need to be creative about uh, how we're designing studies and, and, and he's been an incredible resource for us um, and uh, just a real great ally. And when he's not criticizing me, I just love him. I just adore him. Um, so smaller and impactful trials. That's really kind of what I see that our future, focusing on phase two and not, and maybe early phase three. The other thing that we must, must recognize, and I think that's true and it's representative here because we have people from all over the world, literally. But if you look at the large clinical trials that have been published, mainly done by industry, uh, but done in the United States and done in Asia and Europe. The U.S. has been a relatively small participant um, for lots of different reasons. Um, difficulty of getting clinical trials done here, et cetera. The message being we, mu we, re we must rely on the rest of the world to help us get these um, more difficult studies done. So we, we don't, let's, can't fool ourselves into thinking we can do this uh, in the U.S. This has to be a global effort. And that includes, you know, going to places like South Africa, India, or Canada, or us is really dominant, um, or mucormycosis, et cetera. So, I mean, I think that we need to embrace this. This must be who we are, in my opinion. And, um, and we need to uh, learn how to conduct clinical trials in areas that we've not really gone into much in the past. Epi studies, I hate to even separate these out because honestly we do very few epi studies that are just pure epi studies. They, they all blend together. Epi outcome, um, they all, they kind of tend to merge, you know, one with another. But we have talked about our relationship with CDC. We have a great relationship, a growing relationship with CDC. And thank goodness we have Tom Chiller and, and, and his group at the Mycology Branch that have really helped us. Um, not only just educationally, but also helped us with, you know, on the clinical side as well. And I think that we will continue to grow that relationship. But we have talked about it among our group, what would we want to do uh, in the way of epidemiologic studies? And, you know, these are the ones that we've talked about in the past, a TransNet 2, although TransNet 2 would have to be really different from TransNet 1. It would have to involve a lot less labor. It would, have to, it would have to really mine the electronic database, much like we haven't done in the past. We could look at antifungal resistant aspergillus. We could look at the epi of that or risk factors or treatment outcomes. Same with Canada, similar to MSG16 that Luis just completed. We've talked about these biologic modifiers and um, um, uh, Demetrius and um, Mikhail just talked about this this morning. That was just kind of scratching the surface. We didn't talk about some of the other drugs used for rheumatologic disorders. This is a tough one. This is really tough to tackle. Uh, we, we put it out to a couple of them in our group, John Badley and Demetrius, and I think they came back saying this problem is too complex um, to really do well. And I agree. I mean, it is. There are so many of these agents out there. But we have to we have to come up with some way in which we can begin to quantify the relative risk of at least groups of these somehow, or just focus on the, on a handful that we seem, you know, anecdotally to seem to be really important. So I think there's work to be done there for sure. Cryptococcus gadii, my favorite um, topic when we talk about this. Um, I, I believe that this is a, an endemic infection in the southeastern U.S. 
Um, those of us who live there know this to, to be true. And I think I've talked with Sean Lockhart and he kind of confer, can, has confirmed that this is probably uh, a unique strain. Um, so this needs to be, this, but this is more of a registry than anything else. The endemic fungi, what are the geographic ranges? Can anybody tell me, you know, what they really are? Um, a lot of people are looking at this. Andre Speck has looked at this with Histo, but I think that we, we can do this as a collaborative group and do it very effectively. And, you know, what are the risks for developing these infections? So a lot of things we can do in the epi world. As far as clinical outcomes, I'm not going to um, regurgitate what... Um, what um, um, Jerry just talked about, but we can address virtually any uh, fungal infection using these methods, but we have to have someone that's really facile and has access to these large databases, but there's almost nothing you can't do. Um, you know, the, the, the limitations, I think, and what a, an example would be, uh, we're looking at candidiasis um, and uh, connection to COVID in reviewing the data. If you ask the question candidiasis, you get everything. You get candida from the sputum, from the urine, et cetera. You've got to be really, really specific with what you ask. You have to ask for candidemia, if that's what you want. Um, recognizing that there's a lot of invasive candidiasis that you just may not be able to capture. So it, I think these, these, these analyses, in my view, give you really good kind of 30,000 foot views. When you really get and try to want more granular material, sometimes you you come away a little bit wanting. But anyway, these are just some, some examples. Jerry and I are going to be looking at cryptococcal uh, mortality in individuals who have, only have diabetes. This is really quite possible, mining a database like this. Patient registries. Um, again, we're, you know, it's crossing over. You're getting into you know, the, the large databases and epidemiology, but um, we've, we've already got experience of that. Um, we've got the, you know, the experience that Jerry um, described earlier with uh, esaviconazole, posiconazole, voriconazole. Um, we're talking with F2G about doing an olorafem patient registry, how that's going to be defined, who it's going to capture, et cetera, is yet to be determined. But again, I think that it's, it's something that um, we, we certainly can and will do. It's particularly... Um, uh, targeted to individuals with rare fungal infections, those that you can't do, you know, um, large RCTs, Fusarium, Lamentosporum, Scytosporium, et cetera, or even antifungal resistant Candida aspergillus, and of course, my favorite Candida uh, cryptococcus gadii. And then lastly, and I did not prompt um, or didn't have any idea really what, how deep. Um, Michalis was going to get into this this morning, but this is right down uh, the path of where I think we should be exploring. We've been providing with samples from some of our quote-unquote normals um, with pheohyphomycosis who come up with significant pheohyphomycy infections out of the blue. Uh, people have disseminated blasto for no apparent reason, things like that. And, and this, is, this is where I think as a group as a collaborative group, we can provide them with enormous amount of samples and data. Um, and so just some of the things that are being done, Lyonicus, obviously, at, at NIH, uh, he mentioned uh, Melissa Johnson and their group at Duke. Um, there's Nedia in Belgium. Um, uh, Lyonicus is doing this as well at, at, um, at NIH. The endemic narcosis, uh, G.R. Thompson's had um, uh, a database growing at UC Davis for some time. And then, of course, crypto normal host, which Peter Williamson has a growing group of patients. I think you're, are you over 100? Where's Peter? Yeah, you, are, have you reached over 100 yet? Or are you in, this, in the, I'm sorry? Almost 200. Yep. So, I mean, these are type of things that um, OTRs, Dr. Yoon at Einstein, we've been providing her with samples and collaborating with them for years looking at um, uh, immunologic responses to those OTRs with, um, with crypto. So I, I really think that these are things that we can all get involved in, and, and it's just a matter, really, of coming up with the idea. So this is my last slide. And I, I'd like to really emphasize the last point, but 
um, especially, but there are a lot of opportunities for very unique um, projects. You know, the sky's the limit. Um, and I want the younger investigators to hear this especially. You will not find a more collaborative, friendly, willing to help group than the group in this, in this room and some who aren't here. Um, what has kept us together for so long has been our collegiality, our mutual respect. We're friends, we're from, and we're from all over the world. Um, we have a long history of working together, and we like it. We like working together. Um, and we have access to collectively a large, large number of patients. So for young investigators, this is really important. We do require funding. We need to get funding from a number of different sources. It's been primarily from industry and CDC over the last few years. We need to expand that funding base. But the last point I'd like to make, and I, especially for the, for the younger people who might get discouraged, um, let me just emphasize this. You're limited in this field, uh, or in any, in any field in medicine, certainly, by, really by your imagination, your creativity, um, and it, your ability to stay focused and enthusiastic when your concept and proposal is something that you know is rational and should go forth. Some, you're going you're gonna to hit a wall several times. Most people hit walls several times. There's hardly a person in this room who hasn't run into a brick wall on a number of occasions, being told that, no, this is dumb, or we can't afford it, it's not a priority. You believe in it, you keep pushing it. Good ideas float to the top. Good ideas will find funding eventually. You'll find believers somewhere along the way. So I just wanna encourage you with that, um, and keep that in mind as we, as we talk through some of these um, topics over the next uh, half hour or so. Thank you so much for your attention.